Hi, this is Yafi Lvova, registered dietitian, nutritionist, and owner of Baby Boom Nutrition and Toddler Test Kitchen, sitting in my car in the longest grocery pickup line in history. I've been here for like 45 minutes, so I decided instead of just sitting here, I'm gonna do a nap time nutrition and um, and just make this a three nap time nutrition week. So, so today from <laughs> My parked car in the parking lot. Um, we're going to be talking about gestational diabetes. See, I'll take off my no makeup. Here we go. Um, so gestational diabetes is something that affects a lot of different women. And there, there's a lot of confusion over it and a lot of controversy, especially where nutrition is concerned, when people are trying to care for their nutrition and trying to deal with it um, in a nutrition-focused, woman-focused way. And... Um, so let's just talk about what it is. What is gestational diabetes? Well, it's diabetes that happens during gestation. It happens during pregnancy. And why does this happen? Well, naturally, toward the end of a pregnancy, a lot of women get um, some natural insulin resistance. What happens is if the pancreas can't produce enough insulin in order to counteract that um, that insulin resistance, if it can't kind of beef up its um, its insulin production in order to meet the need, then you end up with gestational diabetes. It is pretty common in places where we don't have a whole lot of medical care. Sometimes it goes unchecked, and that's when you see news stories about women having 16-pound babies, for example. All of that extra sugar in the blood can lead to macrosomia in the baby, which is a big baby. So what are your risk factors? Well, number one um, big risk factor is family history. If you have family history of either diabetes or gestational diabetes, you are more at risk. Um, and if you have a previous baby who was over nine pounds, and sometimes people just have big babies. Honestly, if you look at couples sometimes, you look at families, sometimes people are bigger, sometimes people are taller or larger in other ways, and so it's natural that some of those genes are gonna carry through. Me, I'm 5'4". My husband's 5'5". Five five. We are we are little people in general, so we're not really um, we're not really at risk for that. But my point is that sometimes it's just that the family is very tall, and so the babies are going to naturally be bigger. Okay, this line is moving. Hang on a sec. <laughs> what a world! All right, back in park. Um, so also, if you have a personal history of insulin resistance and that could be um, that could be pre-diabetes for example or if you've got PCOS that is very strongly associated with insulin resistance and also if you are not white um, and the thing is that th that's across the board if you are anything other than Caucasian you have a higher risk for insulin resistance especially during pregnancy so gestational diabetes you are at increased risk for gestational diabetes if you are a um, a race or a culture that is not classified as white there we go um, okay so can you prevent it if you've got all of these lining up if you've got some of these risk factors or all of these risk factors hopefully not um, can you prevent it you you can't really prevent gestational diabetes. And I really want to stress that because there's a lot of guilt that's associated with gestational diabetes. A lot of times women saying that they, they should have done something different or they should have prevented it or had they done this or that, there this is no place for guilt. This is something that is basically a foregone conclusion. Um, there are steps that you can take to ensure that you're healthy going into pregnancy, which could help to, to mitigate what's going on but the truth is that if you are someone who has been diagnosed with gestational diabetes, there is nothing that you did to cause it. Let that sink in for a sec. You did not cause it. Okay, so what can you do? Well, as I said, you can't really prevent it, but what you can do in order to ensure that you're in the healthiest place possible before and during pregnancy and after pregnancy is eat a variety. Look at your colors, eat a lot of colors, have a lot of different food experiences over the course of the day. Experience not only sweet, but salty and bitter and umami and, um, and sour and have creamy and crunchy, have spicy, you know, have lots of different food experiences throughout the day because not only is that more satisfying on a per meal basis, but it makes your, your, your nutrition more adequate. A variety of food experiences in taste and texture and color and flavor, that, that's going to equal 
a variety in nutrients. And that's going to mean that you are at the best place possible to be as healthy as possible at any point in your life cycle and during pregnancy as well, that's included. So what are the warning signs? Um, oh, and physical movement. Physical movement is great, and in intuitive eating, one of the principles is joyful movement. So what's the difference there? It means that you're not torturing yourself on the treadmill, you're lifting weights instead, which you like, or you're not torturing yourself on the weights, you're, you're on the treadmill. Whatever it is that makes you happy, for me, what makes me happy is fitness martial videos on YouTube. So go check that out if that's something that you're into also. I really love that. It's something that makes me smile. Find what makes you smile. What kind of body movement makes you smile and do that. And that's going to lead to health. Again, just like with variety in your food, joyful movement is going to help lead you to health at any life stage, no matter where you are in life. <laughs> And Ariel says, uh, yes, we love him. Of course you do. Of course you do. Just one more thing we have in common. Um, and while you're here, I am also going to say I'm very happy for you that your military husband is home. Yay. Thank you for serving our country, uh, both of you. Um, so warning signs. A lot of times women don't find out that they have gestational diabetes until they take that nasty glucose test. Honestly, and this is a very unpopular opinion. I didn't mind it. <laughs> it totally reminded me of that orange drink that um, that used to be popular when I was a kid and we used to get it in those gigantic jugs. And um, it reminded me of that. So I was cool with the glucose drink. Okay, hang on, car's moving again. One day I will get my groceries, I swear. Okay. All right, back into park. <laughs> All right, so warning signs. A lot of times it's the glucose test. Sometimes you take it once, sometimes you take it twice. If you're not, um, if, if you're not, if you, if you pass it the first time, then you don't have to take it again. If you fail it the first time, you may or may not pass it the second time. A lot of times when you go from the one hour glucose test to the three hour glucose test, you, you really do improve your status um, with the longer amount of time and what looks like it's a problem for the one hour test turns out that over the course of three hours, your body regulates it effectively and it doesn't, it's not a problem. So other warning signs, um, constant thirst and frequent urination. And it seems like those go hand in hand. And I did ask about this when I was in school, that it seems like if you have frequent thirst, you're drinking a lot, which means that you would be naturally urinating a lot. The truth is that it's urination above and beyond what would be normal for the amount you're drinking. So it's something that you would really notice. Fatigue, good, because you're not feeling fatigue the rest of pregnancy, right? Well, take this in, in context. Maybe you're not gonna notice fatigue on its own because you're already tired. Um, also, also nausea, and the thing is that most nausea happens at the beginning of pregnancies. Um, car is moving. <laughs> what a world. Um, a lot of times women feel nauseous naturally during the beginning of pregnancy. This is happening more towards the end of pregnancy. So maybe you got over that, that hump of morning sickness and now you're just in weird nausea that came out of nowhere. So that's your warning sign. Also increased frequency of infections, vaginal infections, bladder infections, skin infections, and also blurred vision. That's also a difficult one because as your body expands during pregnancy, your eyes also actually change shape a little bit. So if you, it, it may be some a conversation to have with your doctor. If you're noticing blurred vision, you should certainly speak to your OB. They may send you to an eye doctor in order to check out to see what's going on. Um, so there, there is some amount of blurred vision that may be common during your normal healthy pregnancy. This is also a sign um, of GDM. So here's some trivia for you. Um, gestational diabetes is actually more frequent when you're pregnant with a boy. That's, I find that interesting. I'm gonna have to look up exactly why that is. So what can you do about it? And this is really where there's a major trigger for people who have a big history of dieting, people who have been kind of making their life's goal to be smaller and you may hear that you need to lose weight. Well, it's not a good idea to actively lose weight during pregnancy. 
I'm a non-diet, anti-diet dietitian, so my goal is never to advise you in ways to make the, the scale change its number. That's not what we're going for here. I, I don't have a weight-centric approach. Um, what you really want to do is really focus on a variety of nutrition. Make sure that you're getting, as I mentioned, a variety of food experiences throughout the day. And really enjoy your food. And also think about food combinations. And this isn't your standard food combining that you're not supposed to have protein with carbohydrates because it rots in your system or something. I did another segment on that. I'm calling BS on that. I don't like that. Um, it doesn't have any, any backing in science. The food combination I want to talk to you about is more making a context for your sugar. I've, I've done a number of segments on carbohydrates and the truth is that the entire goal of digestion is to take the food you're eating and turn it into sugar. That's what the body thrives on. The body, the body is fueled by sugar. It will take anything and turn it in to sugar. So that's not really the focus. That's, we're, we're not demonizing that. We're not demonizing sugar because that's what the body needs to fuel. So what you want to do is make sure that anytime you're having a meal that has something sweet or is higher in carbohydrates, you're also having protein and fat and fiber. And that's going to slow down your glucose response. So you're at a birthday party. There's going to be, let's say, ice cream cake super good, right? Try to have it closer to your meal um, so that you're effectively having it with dinner as opposed to after dinner on its own. Because what happens is when you have something sweet on its own, then you're going to have a blood sugar spike and crash. And if you have it in the context of fat and protein and fiber, it's going to come up and then go flat and then come down gently. You're not going to have the spike or the crash, and you're not going to have the, the symptoms that are associated with that. You may also want to consider frequent small meals. Let that sink in as I move my car slightly before going into park for another 15 minutes. <laughs> this is fun. Okay, back into park. So frequent small meals can also be ooh, an effective way to help control your blood sugar. So. Um, Instead of having three meals, instead of having breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're going to focus on having snacks throughout the day. And that means that instead of your blood sugar going spike, crash, spike, crash, it's going to be kind of doing this all day. So you have frequent small meals, six, seven meals per day. Um, and if that works for you, then that's, that's a good idea. Um, okay, paying attention to what works for you. What does work for you? Think about it. Everyone reacts slightly differently to food. Sometimes people will have a, a spike and a crash from one food and someone else is not going to have a spike and a crash from the same food. I actually heard recently about a woman who had, um, who had a lot of, of blood sugar issues when having whole wheat but not white. That does not fit with what I learned at all. But you know what? You are not a textbook. My learning is from a textbook. What we need to do as professionals is take that textbook knowledge and apply it to you as a person rather than you as a disease state or as a health state. It's you as a person. You're an individual and should be treated as such, which means that if you have questions about this and you feel like you need some guidance through gestation and diabetes in order to feel confident and to feel healthy, you really want to touch base with someone who can give you advice one-on-one, -on -one, advice that is based on your needs, your circumstances, your health status. Um, and movement. It's very important to, to move your body in ways that is comfortable and joyful for you. So find out what works. Maybe it's a walk around the block. Maybe it's a YouTube video. Maybe it's Tai Chi or yoga. Or maybe it's something more active. Hang on, move in the car. <laughs> We're having fun. Um, so, <laughs> all right, in park again. So it's very important to, to feel empowered and to feel strong and to feel confident with this diagnosis and to know that you're doing the best you can for your body, for your family, and for your baby. So definitely talk to your doctor. Contact a non-diet, anti-diet dietitian if you really want help to really make this make sense and make it work for you and take into account all of the things that make you you. With that, I'm going to end this session. Hopefully I get my groceries one of these days. Um, I think it's been an hour now I've been waiting in this line. So I, um, I hope that I provided some really good information because that would make this ridiculous wait like Disneyland style worth it. 
and I am certainly going to enjoy, I think I have a jicama coming, so <laughs> it's not even ice cream. All right, well, have a wonderful weekend. Happy 4th of July, and I will see you next week. Thanks.